Hey everybody, welcome, welcome to my first video episode. My name is Matthew. I founded the Crypto Voices podcast exactly six years ago today. And at the time, that was exactly eight years after the great Satoshi Nakamoto released his famed Bitcoin client software to the world. On this channel, I'm going to give you quick, thorough, and detailed analysis on a variety of data sets covering the economy, the markets, politics, money, gold, silver, and Bitcoin. So this is a charting engine that I've created on the back of some great open source software that I'm kind of going to use as the backbone of most of my videos. Uh, I figured we start out very simple today, very concrete, something that covers a lot of topics, and that is the physical currency supply of the United States. Okay, and what is physical currency? That is the actual cash and coin, the physical banknotes you hold in your wallet, the coins that jingle in your pocket or your purse, the actual cash and coin, very basic, nothing more, that probably pretty much everyone knows and understands, even today in our digital world. So we're going to break up this video into a couple parts. In the first part, I'm going to just explain the basics of the money supply, how it grows, how it looked like in the past, how it looks like today. And in the second part, I'm going to do a little bit more economic analysis, show some, uh, some trend lines, show some growth rates, very important things to look at in uh, economics and finance. So let's go and just take all this analysis off for now. Let's just look at the physical money supply. I'm gonna go ahead and answer the very first question that was posed in the thumbnail. How large is the United States currency supply? How much cash and coin is there in the world? Well, if you look at just a couple days ago, it was published by the Central Bank of the United States, that's the Federal Reserve and it was $2,297 billion. In other words, it's $2.3 trillion of cash and coin that's circulating throughout not just the United States, but around the world. Some of you may know that the $100 bill is actually the most transacted physical currency note uh, outside of the United States. So most $100 bills are actually outside of the United States. And this is a trend that has continued for decades now. And if you look at the chart, you can probably surmise it's going to continue for a while, even in the midst of all of the hype about the digital age that we're in. And just a couple notes about the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States. I mentioned them already. They are actually only in charge of the banknote portion of the physical currency supply. That is the actual $1 bills, $5 bills, $10 bills that uh, most of you probably know. The coins are still under the purview of the United States Mint, the United States Treasury. And that actually has deeper historical uh, roots in the United States Constitution. The founders uh, actually wrote that only the Congress can mint uh, money, can mint coinage. That still remains. Uh, the actual coins are minted by the Treasury, but the banknotes in the uh, waning hours of 1913, December 1913, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act into law. And in 1914, the Federal Reserve opened its doors for business as not the first bank of the United States, but the current bank and the most lasting central bank of the United States. They are in control of all of the banknotes. They have a monopoly on printing all of the banknotes that circulate in the United States and outside the United States of America. Uh, another interesting thing, of course, with the physical currency supply is we're going to overlap periods where gold was still active in our money supply. I think in the last 10 to 15 years, especially since the global financial crisis, a lot more people have investigated the nature of money, not only in the United States, but just generally. Uh, I include myself in that umbrella, the financial crisis of 2008. I was quite young out of university at the time. I was working. Everybody thought that they were amazing and rich and taking cheap loans. And uh, I lived outside of the United States, uh, by the way. 
but the same phenomenon happened uh, in Eastern Europe where I was working at the time. And it just seemed interesting uh, that all the markets, everything could collapse at once. Tried to look a little bit deeper, looked into the money supply. And I've been doing that ever since. And that, of course, got me down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and many other things. But um, the point of all that is just to say that I think that a lot of people uh, now generally understand that our money has no connection to historical basic monies, such as gold and silver. I think most people understand that, but perhaps not all. So we're going to go through that uh, here. So let's just go uh, from, remember I said the Federal Reserve opened their doors in 1914. This data set actually starts in August of 1917. And I already told you that the physical currency supply today, cash and coin, is $2.3 trillion. What was it in August of 1917? $3.7 billion. So again, understanding how to make sense of the difference there, that's a huge difference, all right? 2000 300 billion dollars versus just about four billion dollars 105 years ago uh, it's very important to understand how to analyze that and to uh to go through these things so that's what i'm gonna try to do on this channel now peter Thiel he likes to say that he prefers to not ask and answer why questions uh, there's a lot of room for chicanery with a why question i agree with him on this channel again i'm going to try to just show you what is happening and i'm going to try to show you how it's happening um and i think i think that's enough i think from that point uh it's up to you to make decisions that's best for your family for your community and and for your life so of course this is not investment advice i hate saying that i've said that a lot on my channel uh, it's written everywhere i guess we kind of have to say it uh, in this day and age but no this is educational only and yes though we are circling many things around the economy and around finance. This is definitely uh, not financial advice. So having said all of that, let's get started. You can see uh, these peaks here. I just want to show you how it works. Uh, what are these little peaks that you can generally see? Uh, there, there were some irregularities for sure, but these general peaks occurred uh, typically at the end of the year. Okay, this is the seasonality of money. And why would they occur at the end of the year? Well, the harvest was completed traditionally. And, and still to this day, this trend uh, continues, although it's not as pronounced, certainly in more advanced economies like the United States, it's not as pronounced as the cyclicality, the seasonality you saw in the past. Like you see here in the 20s, you see in the 30s, uh, you see those little bumps at the end of the year, November, December, it bumps up, and then it goes back down in the wintertime. There is a little bump again in the springtime when the planting season occurs, but it's not as pronounced as the end of the harvest, Christmas time, all the rest. That is a uh, very, very long before this, long before the United States. That's just, just the trend of money. When the crops need to be harvested, that's when people demand to be paid. And that's when employers need cash as well uh, to pay their employees. So there was a uh, small depression here in 1920, which Tom Woods has made famous. I'm not going to go through that. I'm not going to go through the why of these things. You can see the money supply increase a little bit before that and then drop off after that. And then when you get to the Great Depression, you can see that the money supply was pretty flat, actually, from the beginning. $4.5 billion at the onset of the Great Depression after the Roaring Twenties, uh, $800 million higher than it was in 1917. Now, many people say the Federal Reserve didn't do enough during the Great Depression. Some say the Federal Reserve did too much during the Great Depression. But nonetheless, as far as the physical currency supply goes, we see that it did fall uh, even more during the uh, during the Great Depression. It rose up again as we get closer to uh, Roosevelt coming into office. There was New Deal plans that were being promised. Again, this is just physical cash. There's certainly a, a ledger component or a claim balance component to the money supply checks. Um, bankers credits those types of things existed but they are not part of this money supply this is only banknotes and coins uh included in this money supply so here we get to the gold reserve act this was actually one of the first things that roosevelt implemented and this made gold illegal to hold by americans it also devalued uh well it just after the gold reserve act was passed uh, he devalued the price of gold which was fixed statutorily uh at one one twentieth 
the ounce of gold would be $1 or $20 would buy you one ounce of gold. Uh, that was devalued for $35 an ounce just at this time. And the Great Depression continued on, continued on here. Uh, currency supply continued. Then we get to World War II. You still see the seasonality of farming, but you see that the money supply really peaked in World War II. Now, am I saying that we printed money just to pay for everything in World War II? Probably partly here, but remember, this is physical currency. Uh, absolutely, currency really rocketed from here, flowing into Europe. Uh, the euro dollar started just after World War II. The euro dollar, by the way, has nothing to do with the euro currency. The euro dollar is basically dollars that are held in bank accounts outside of the United States. So outside the jurisdiction of the Federal Reserve. That started pretty much around this time, around World War II. But these are actual dollars. This is physical cash. This is not euro dollars. But you still see that dollars were increasing. Now, does it mean that we needed to print all those dollars to pay for tanks and bombs and all those things? Not necessarily. There were, again, non-monetary instruments that were used. Uh, bills of credit, checks, and war bonds, of course, as well, were raised by the government to do that. But nonetheless, the Federal Reserve did print a lot of money during World War II, and we know that a lot of money started to go overseas during World War II. After the war ended in uh, 1945, just before actually, uh, in August 1944, as the war was winding down, the Bretton Woods Conference occurred. This were many notable economists were there. Milton Friedman, Ludwig von Mises, many others were there. Uh, and here was basically the, the setup for for the post-war, post-gold redemption dollar standard. And so what that meant basically is at this point, so up until this point and up until World War II, the monetary system was pretty much based uh, by gold. Uh, it, it, the, the international gold standard had collapsed uh, after World War I. We're really at the start of World War I. But there was still gold was used as a, as, as a monetary unit. It was traded. It was shipped around the world. It was definitely used by all central banks in the world. But what happened here with gold, which I'm, I will show you on other charts, I'm just going to explain at this point, was gold started to flow out of Europe in particular due to Hitler, due to Stalin, started to flow out of Europe and into the, the United States, particularly into the New York Fed. And so the gold left Europe and went into the United States. Europe also, of course, was crushed, uh, had to rebuild the Marshall Plan, all the rest during World War II. The gold was in the United States. So at this point, economists just thought, well, it's going to be easier. Let's settle everything with international trade, shipping, oil, all the rest. Let's start settling these things more in dollars. And then if you, government, dear central bank around the world from another country, really want to claim your gold, come to the U.S., sell us back uh, our dollars and we'll give you back your gold. That was the idea of the Bretton Woods Conference. Okay, so here we are, basically at the beginning of uh, the, the progressive era, the modern era, the, the 20th century. Uh, we had quite a big spike in the money supply from $3.7 billion in August 1917 to $28.3 billion in July 1946. Okay, let's move out a little bit more now. Let's go from the end of World War II, the beginning of Bretton Woods, to the end of Bretton Woods and the Vietnam War. Notice we still have the cyclicality in physical currency, still exists in the, in the go go years of the 60s, the 70s with bell bottoms, all the rest uh, is still going on. Doesn't matter. Uh, people really need uh, cash at the end of the year. You see it. And a little bit in the springtime, a little bit jumps in the springtime as opposed to the rest of the year. So here's Bretton Woods. The money supply increased, levels off a little bit, and then we have the Vietnam War. Okay, this next major, major event uh, begins actually before, before Kennedy. Um, the Vietnam War begins, and it goes all the way until 1975. So this is a very, um, very pronounced war uh, across many U.S. presidents. Uh, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And the money supply increased uh, pretty much constantly. And during this time, what happened, again, I will show this in future videos actually showing the data, but what happened here was the dollars were increasing, but also the United States deficit was increasing, uh, debt was increasing, war debt was increasing because of the Vietnam War. 
So this agreement that was made in Bretton Woods was starting to become a little bit suspect by other central banks and governments around the world, most notably France. Interesting, ironic, because the U.S. took over the Vietnam War pretty much from the French, uh, but the French were not happy with all of the, the spending and the perceived value of the dollar by this time in the late 60s and the 70s. So what happened was, it finally happened during the Richard Nixon administration, but de Gaulle, the French, some other European nations were claiming their gold back. They were giving their dollars back to the Federal Reserve, giving their dollars back to the United States, say, we want our gold, ship it back over to Europe. It's time. And what did Nixon do? Well, he said no. He said no. This was called the Nixon shock. It was also basically the de facto end of Bretton Woods, where this dollar gold convertibility that had existed for the prior 30 years ended. Nixon, of course, said this was a temporary measure. He said this was to protect the dollar, all of these things that they like to say when they're in these positions. Uh, this uh, continuation of what he does still exists today. So now we have no convert from this point, we have no convertibility of the dollar. There is no gold written in any of the statutes. There's no gold dollar convertibility at all. All other nations pretty much followed this as well. Not all, I should say. Switzerland actually kept up dollar gold convertibility until the year 2000. But most nations around this time also ended any gold type convertibility to their currency. So pretty much from this time in 1971, we were in a pure fiat era. Now, not entirely, I just want to show you a couple more dates here. Uh, there was something called the Smithsonian Agreement, which started here, I believe it was a group of 10 major nations that said, okay, we're still going to try to tie the dollar a little bit. Let's raise the price, devalue the dollar. It went up to $38 an ounce. Uh, at the time, we'll still have a statutory dollar rate, a dollar, uh, dollar gold rate, gold pegged to the dollar. We're still going to have it. We're still going to use it. We're still going to convert, but it's not going to be as strong as Brenton Woods, so on and so forth. And this little agreement called the Smithsonian Agreement only lasted uh, six years. It ended here in 19, the end of 1976. So from this point exactly, you see the Vietnam War ended here in 1975, but from this point in 1976, there was no dollar gold convertibility at all. It wasn't even written down anywhere at all, as it refers to the United States' uh, obligations to return gold in exchange for any dollars that any central bank wanted. So really from this point is when it ended. And they raised the price even during this point up to uh, $42 an ounce from $38 an ounce. And that's actually officially what the statutory rate is today. That's how the United States values gold on its own balance sheet, on the Federal Reserve's own balance sheet, because the Federal Reserve still holds gold on its balance sheet. But it has nothing to do with the market. Gold started to float freely in the market during this time as well. And that's it. Basically, when the Smithsonian Agreement ended, that was it for gold and the dollar. And like I said, some other nations continued on. Switzerland had Swiss franc gold convertibility until the year 2000, but that was it. All right, so there we go. That is uh, basically the modern ending of gold and money. From this point on, from the Smithsonian Agreement on, we just have fiat money. We just have the dollar. We don't have gold. Again, this Federal Reserve holds gold. People hold gold. You can buy gold. You can sell gold, thankfully. Uh, it's not illegal anymore, but we don't have the convertibility with the money. And for a while, people thought that was okay. We entered into this period, and we had Paul Volcker, who uh, we had a high inflation in the 70s. Paul Volcker uh, pricked that bubble by raising interest rates to 20% by 1980. Again, we'll show you these charts. But during this period is actually uh, after 1980, we saw lower interest rates and higher asset prices. And it became known as the great moderation, basically from 1980 to the year 2000, maybe a little bit on after 2000, after Alan Greenspan lowered interest rates after 9-11 and the dot-com boom and bust. But basically from this year, it was a quiet period. People thought, okay, maybe we don't need gold. Maybe it's fine. No problem. Uh, we just have, we just have the dollar. You see this little, little wrinkle here, little uh, bump. What is this? I'm not labeling it, but we're just going to look on the tooltip here. We got uh, December 1999, $596 billion worth of cash and coin. But what was this little bump? It was Y2K. It was Y2K. It was the 
It was the famous Y2K bug or some of the Unix issues, fears that a lot of the systems would go down, financial systems as well. Uh, and there were a lot of doom and gloomers that were really, really worried about this. And uh, rightly or wrongly, people took cash out of banks. And that's what this little bump is. Now, it's not much because just a couple compared to th today, I should say it's not much. But uh, just a couple months before, right, we were at somewhere $530 billion. And then at December of 1999, $596 billion. So it was a big bump in physical cash. And then it went back down, but we also had the dot-com boom and bust. We had 9-11, a lot of troubles in the U.S. economy. During this time, Alan Greenspan lowered interest rates to historically low levels, which is the other thing, basically, that the Federal Reserve does is they control the interest rates, but they do that via the money supply. So they control interest rates, they control the money supply. And then we had the uh, the 2000s. We had the Iraq War, we had Afghanistan War. Um, still some uncertainty in the economy, but we had much lower interest rates than, say, here in the 1980s. And we had a lot of asset bubbles, and these things will be discussed in other videos. The bubbles, of course, led to the global financial crisis. The, uh, the cheap debt, the mortgage-backed securities, all of the confusion about repackaging debt and selling it on to someone else with that person that was sold on to not understanding how risky that debt was led to the global financial crisis all governments uh I should say many many governments around the world were affected by this many many communities around the world were affected by this you had you know communities in norway buying bad mortgage backed securities from wall street you had just this was really global and it really was the first global financial crisis. You know, there are other things, again, I keep, I'm saying this already too much in the first video. We're gonna talk about the Asian crisis in the 90s. We're gonna talk about other crises, financial crises, but this was really, really one of the first global financial crises where everybody, everybody was affected. And, uh, and then after that, what happened with the money supply? So let's zoom in a little bit here. Um, we have the little bump here from Y2K. Money supply actually dipped down a little bit on the trend, and then it bumped up after the global financial crisis. This is, again, just physical cash, just physical cash and coin. And then, don't need to label it here, in recent years, we had an increase and we had a big jump. Why did we have this jump? Answering a why question. Of course, it was from COVID. It was from the global COVID pandemic. Uh, governments printed a lot of money to stimulate the economy, stimulus checks, so on and so forth. And so cash as well increased in the economy. But notice an interesting thing with this trend. This is one of the last things I want to conclude with this intro video. Notice this period here, post-financial crisis, and of course this period post-COVID. Satoshi Nakamoto released Bitcoin just uh, after this. It was actually uh, October 31st, November 1st. It was released to the, uh, to the different mailing lists, his famous white paper. And as I mentioned, on uh, January 9th, 2009 the uh let's just go to it on the chart right there january 9th 2009 the uh bitcoin client software was released uh, to the world so satoshi actually mined and minted the first uh, block the genesis block on january 3rd 2009 but he worked on it he tweaked it a couple more days and then he bootstrapped it through uh, irc and different different chats different newsletters uh, different mailing lists uh, starting January 9th, 2009, that's when the client software was released. So that was really the first, I shouldn't say the first, but that was a continuation of a cypherpunk digital revolution in money. There's been many tries uh, in, in different digital forms of cash before, but this really kicked it off. Bitcoin really kicked it off. And now notice what happens during the physical supply of money during this time. Isn't it kind of interesting to you? So, so Bitcoin is kicked off here in January 2009. And as we start to get to 2013, 2014, 2015, Bitcoin isn't going away. People are understanding the protocol. They're trying to work with it more. They're interesting. They're developing. It's open source. It's fantastic. People are talking about it. But in the mainstream, the corporate press are saying, this really isn't something. But, you know, a central bank digital currency, that would be something. This stuff all started mid-decade, mid-2015s. Uh, and notice what's happening to the physical supply there. Does it look like it's decreasing? If we really need a central bank digital currency, that's what's gonna be the X factor of the economy. Wouldn't you think that the demand and the supply for physical currency would be falling at that time? 
No, it's actually growing. Just using our eyes, we can tell that it's growing faster than it was in the decade prior. And even let's reset. Let's go out a little bit more here. Let's do almost, let's do this actually. Let's do almost the total great moderation. You don't, you don't need to use any fancy math just to look at this. The curve here was more gradual, more gradual here, a little bit less gradual here, but still gradual. And then all of a sudden, that's very much less gradual. It's steepening quite a bit, steepening quite a bit. And then of course, COVID until we get to today, $2.3 trillion. So it's a rhetorical question. I just want to pose it to you at the end of this video. If everybody says that digital currency is the future, digital currency is the only thing we need. Central bank digital currency is very important. It's going to make the economy much better. Why is it that physical currency is growing and it's growing actually at a faster clip than it was in the past? So that's it for this video. In part two, we're actually going to talk about how this money supply grew, how fast, how to analyze it, how to understand it. And do we really need to look at 50 other charts, compare it to GDP, compare it to other things? Or can we actually understand, comprehend, and learn from the very simple money supply that we have right here? So see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for joining.